I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshash Alliance Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Sudisha, and with me today I have Arushi. Both of us are working as junior research scholars with the Takshashila Institution. and majorly focusing on a project called 20 million jobs in this project we imagine a situation in india where we are able to generate 20 million jobs per year so in this podcast we are going to discuss an issue which is mostly not covered in the media properly and it's only recently been highlighted by cmi which is that a lot of indians are not looking for jobs so we often talk about the fact that there are not enough jobs for people in our country but uh, now we have a situation where people are not voluntarily looking for jobs and this is exactly what we'll be discussing in this podcast so arushi uh, would you like to come up with present some data that is relevant to this topic thank you so much for having the episode uh, and to talk about some data that is available when it comes to you know unemployment and you know discouraged labor force as we want to talk about today the most important part is that the cmi has said that around 900 million indians have voluntarily exited the workforce because they don't want to look for jobs and this is important in the context of how we even define what unemployment means and it's a point i will get to in a bit a second very very alarming number is that between 2017 and 2022 the overall labor force participation rate has dropped from 46% to 40% and among women the data is even worse uh, about 21 million women have disappeared from the workforce which means essentially only 9% of the eligible population is now looking for position now we have to understand that india is still largely a farm based economy and as we move towards a uh, better industrialization as we move want to move away from farming as a major source of our gdp it is important to create these non farm jobs and keeping up with the fact that we have a huge amount of people who turn 18 every single year we need to create at least 90 million new non farm jobs by 2030 according to a report by the mckinsey global institute now another thing to note is also that less than 43% of all employment contracts in india's organized workforce are ensuring basic social security for people such as pf coverage gratuity healthcare and maternity benefits only about 40% of regular salaried workers have at least one social security benefit and why all of this becomes important in the context of what we're talking about today is that we need to understand that unemployment is not the most important way to understand the labor market while an unemployment rate was at 7.9% in december 2021 it does not mean that the rest 92.1% of the population was employed it does not even mean that all of these people were working or working age or employed out of these or for population the unemployment rate is merely telling us the proportion of people in the working age who want to be employed and are looking for wages but in spite of you know looking for a job they're not able to find one Now the unemployment rate is not taking into account everyone who's not looking for a job and this is the number that has been exponentially rising especially since the pandemic and even more so as the economy opens up. So Sudisha why do you think that is the case as someone who recently started working what according to you could be reasons for people being discouraged from entering the workforce even despite the historically high number of openings that are present in come. Yeah so I think a succinct answer for that would be that the major problem when it comes to jobs in india is the issue of underemployment which means that you know we spend so much money and so many years in in colleges and in schools where the curriculum is just so just not good enough for people of our caliber and by our caliber i mean everyone in the country i think as a country we have a huge potential when it comes to education and career but despite that potential it gets wasted 
in curriculum that is not updated. It's uh, it's very textual. It's very theoretical. It's not practical at all. And after doing all that, after spending our parents' money and you know living in dorms and all that experience that happens when we study in colleges and schools, our skills are not being used. You know, you go to a bank, for example, you go to public sector bank, and you see that most of the employees there are actually engineers, and you know, it begs the question, why did you do engineering in the first place? And the answer to that is, if, if someone were to answer this question, they'd be like, I did not want to do. Or the other answer would be that a job was not waiting for me when I completed engineering. So this is a very major issue in India where, you know, employees are underemployed, their skills are not being used. That's that's one issue. Another example would be, you know, postgraduates standing in line for clerical jobs for government exams that happen, right? Which is a whole story, all another story altogether. Apart from that, there is a skill gap, which we talk about a lot in our project that, you know, for example, I have the caliber of, of learning graphic designing, but uh, I do not have the hardware facilities for that. And let's say my company even offers me that um, there's a good possibility that, you know, someone richer than younger than me who had those facilities in his or her life before um, they were able to learn graphic designing earlier than me. So there's this he's that person is just ahead of me without, you know, despite the fact that I am much older than them and I should have had those opportunities, but I did not. So, you know, we have this economic and even a problem wherein you know so many people in India are from are from backgrounds where there is no privilege right and they're missing out they don't have the skills to compete with people in cities or towns where there are some jobs which are non-farm jobs and they just don't have the skills to match with that so they get discouraged and then Another facet of all this is that a huge chunk of this this workforce are women, and they they face a host of other challenges, right? They they face patriarchy, they face sexism at workplace. They can't commute like men. They have restrictions. They can't do those jobs at night, which men can easily do, right? So there are a host of challenges. So what this is creating, these complex issues are creating a complex problem which is that these all these workers are discouraged, right? It's so funny that I think a, a couple of days ago, I was reading a news piece in which the news piece mentioned that uh, probably the four-day work week is going to be introduced in India. And uh, I think the clause for that was it can only be introduced when you work for 12 hours a day. And it was so funny to me because... You don't need to bring that clause. You know, Indian employees are already working 8 to 12 hours a day. It's not like, you know, all the employees are shutting the, shutting off their systems at 5 p.m. and going back home. It's not happening. Everyone, most of the people are underemployed, underpaid and overworked in this country. And that's a fact. As someone who's been working and I've seen my peers also, that's a fact. Now, what, what that is creating is it's discouraging everyone. And that's probably the reason why, you know, the great attrition rate is happening. So many people are voluntarily quitting the workforce without any backups. And that may also be a good thing, you know, with LinkedIn introducing the break option in their profiles. It can also be a good thing that, you know, perhaps... Now people do not think less of taking a break. They think that it's an important step in their career. So perhaps it's also a good thing. We we don't know for sure. But we we definitely know that there's definitely a negative aspect to it. And it's a big one. That while some people may voluntarily be quitting jobs or, uh, you know, moving away from the workforce because they have, let's say, you know, they were, they, they are living on rental income. For example, or, you know, I mean, they just have enough money saved up. You know, we have early retirement and all those options. So that's a positive scenario. But the truth is that 
the main reason why this is happening is well it's a negative problem right it's it's happening because we are underemployed we are overworked and there are just not good enough jobs that are existing and that actually you know brings me to the point that Craig Jeffrey made he's a scholar he i think in early 2000 I think around 2005, he was in India and he was researching underemployment in Uttar Pradesh. And he went to uh, Meerut and he saw that a huge chunk of the population there, young population, they were under they were unemployed, let alone underemployment. And it's like they did not care. And the term that he gave these people was generation nowhere. And when you read any unemployment discourse in India, you will see that Generation Nowhere is used a lot. In fact, I was reading an article by the print in which now this Generation Nowhere has almost uh, like really cheap data packs. So now this Generation Nowhere is, has something to spend their time on, which is a complete waste of time, right? Uh, they just... Use those data packs to browse social media and do gaming online and all that. So the fact is that it's actually a very difficult scenario. It's gruesome, to put it simply. And it's something that uh, that needs check, you know, especially the fact that governments are uh, exploiting the fact. Right. So you mentioned that it's important to see how unemployment and employment is measured in the country. And I've seen that the UP government, for example, recently pointed out that unemployment has reduced from around 17% 17 to 5%. But the fact is, and CMI actually corrected them, that that's not what happened. What happened is that people have moved away from the workforce. They are voluntarily not looking for a job. So I think maybe you can talk about how this kind of data can be easily manipulated when it comes to governments or just the general discourse in India. Right. So I think just to like add on to like things that you said, like something that even I noticed in a podcast that we recorded last week, which is on return to office policy, was that the expectations are varying right now, like whether people want flexible work hours and that's not being offered to them. Or beyond that, if we were to look at things like, you know, offering them the opportunity to work from home or work in a hybrid setting. And I think those are policies that could induce a part of the workforce back in. Secondly, unemployed Indians are generally students or those that are you know, part of the care economy at home. And many of them, as you said, are surviving on, say, incomes from other sources apart from a traditional job, which could be rental income, the pensions of elderly household members, or, you know, some sort of government transfer, which during COVID, we've seen a lot of those happen. Because of the fact that without doing anything, these people are able to make do and survive, it also disincentivizes these people from getting skills that could make them employable, that could give them the kind of jobs that they have expectations for. But to go back to your question about why aren't, you know, how is the government manipulating data? I think the, a very good example is how unemployment is defined and seen in the U.S. So now generally, when you look at the U.S. economy, you're familiar with one official figure which the government talks about. And that's the case with almost any country. Um, say for a given year, that number in a country is 4.8%. Uh, this was the unemployment, official unemployment rate at the beginning of 2070. However, that is just one of the six alternatives that is used by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics to quantify labor underutilization. Um, one, the first definition is people unemployed six, 15 weeks or longer as a share of the total civilian labor force. That's only a 1.9%. After this, people who lost jobs and who completed temporary jobs, you go up to 2.3%. Total unemployment, which is the country's official rate, is at 4.8%. All of these unemployed people plus discouraged workers as a share of the total and discouraged labor force is at 5.1%. And now this number starts to look scary. The previous category, if you enlarge it by all the people who are only marginally attached to the labor force through gig work, maybe is at 5.8%, an entire percentage point higher than the official rate. And the most broadest category is those who 
includes the previous categories, but also who work only part time for economic reasons. That is, they would prefer to work full time, and that is at a staggering nine point four percent in twenty seventeen. Now, all of these measures are presenting a spread of values ranging from one point nine percent to almost nine point four percent. The range almost being eight percentage points, and the official unemployment rate is only half that. Of the most income passing rate, and that is exactly how numbers are manipulated when we talk about measures. Because one thing that measuring something does is it enters subjectivity. You, the minute you say you're going to measure something, there is subjectivity about who gets included and who doesn't. The same goes for any kind of measuring that happens, whether it is who is above the poverty line, who is below the poverty line. You know, who gets classified as a part of the formal workforce versus who's not. Or even more generally, numbers are more familiar with today. Who gets counted as a part of the COVID death toll and who doesn't? So it's not specific to just the economy. This is a story as old as time that manipulation of numbers happens not necessarily through fake data, but by very very clever definitions of how you define the thing you're measuring. And I think that's exactly what has been happening. The most dominant narrative in the world today is that our unemployment rate is manageable. Yet we're not looking at the fact that that our labor force participation rate has been going down, which is worrying given the fact that for the longest time India has banked on its demographic dividend to pay off, and if these people who are a part of this demographic dividend, the youth of today, aren't looking for jobs, you have fewer people employed. If you have fewer people employed, you're going to have less output, which means lower GDP growth, and that should be worrying, because the estimate given by McKinsey Global Institute for India. To continue, you know, to be able to employ the people into non-farm jobs is at eight to eight point five percent, which is just slightly lower than the measure we came up with when we said that India needs an employment elasticity of zero point four and GDP growth of at least ten percent to create these twenty million jobs to have a sustainable economy. And I think this is also becomes important in understanding the psychology of people and the kind of jobs they're looking at. More recently, we saw the new labor industrial. We saw the you know new industrial code, which led to ad hoc contractualization and deunionization of the Indian workforce, which has not just reduced the amount of jobs that people would now willingly go for, but it has also severely degraded the quality of the jobs that are present. Second thing that has happened is over time, we've noticed that the number of business persons or entrepreneurs has been rising in India. But at the same time, the number of salaried people has been going down. And since Feb 2020, right before you know we saw the pandemic take its biggest leap, we've seen that the number of business people has been going up, which means that people are now preferring lower job security that comes from being an entrepreneur over job security that could come from a job. And that is something that we should be thinking about. And I think, other than that, we need to understand that. Right now, we've reached a point wherein we have been around family. If people are around family who's been supportive to them, who which is a conducive work environment for them, asking them to ad hoc move for a job is not the most feasible thing to do as well. During the pandemic, people have moved. People have changed their preferences. For instance, you know, pursuing remote work as is being seen in multiple surveys that are being conducted. It's a benefit with no, you know, benefit of a life where you don't have to commute. You just move from one room to another at max. The economy itself has shifted, wherein you know you aren't looking at traditional jobs anymore. You're looking at a very, very different geography for jobs that people are looking at, and it's very important to understand the psyche of the people who are looking for these jobs and this mismatch that exists between the jobs that we have. Versus the expectations of the people, the skills of the people, and more importantly, the narratives that are playing out in dominant media. As you mentioned, you know, electorally, these become important. In a podcast we recorded previously, Sudisha spoke about how job creation and employment became a very, very contentious issue during the UP polit uh, UP elections earlier this year. And I think that just goes on to highlight how important numbers become politically. Uh, where they are no longer just mere symbols or something that was being measured, but it becomes a way to justify other things that are happening in the country, and that is something that is why every number that we look at shouldn't be looked at as merely a number, but we should be looking at what exactly is it really measuring.
Yeah, great answer. So I think before we move to the last segment of the podcast, let's take a short break. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid. Okay, we're back. So I think in the last segment, what I wanted to discuss with you was, so what can be done about this? I think the first thing that uh, we need to do in our country is to assess whether this thing is positive or negative. Because when you look at the reasons why this is happening, there are some positive outcomes to that as well. So one of them being that perhaps many people are relying on rental incomes and to me i think that's a positive scenario you know you don't necess- not everyone has to do a job if you're getting paid in one way or another uh, you don't have to be enrolled in a salary job so for me that's a positive scenario so i think the first thing that needs to be done is that there should be data on this on where exactly these people are going it's not something that can easily be collected of course i realize that But I think in the long term, you know, not just policymakers, government, and think think tanks and all. I think proper research should be conducted to figure out where these people are exactly going. Right. So that's the first step. I think the second step should be that the discourse, when it comes to unemployment, should not just be about having enough number of jobs for the unemployed people in this country. but improving the quality of jobs that are available and i think that's very very important right now when you look at the kind of jobs and it lets you are paying instead versus the kind of jobs that we are doing um we are demanding more we just do not want to pack our bags at 5 pm and get a salary and not get transferred to another location and you know some of the things that people wanted before it's changing a lot many people are moving to the private sector they are ready to relocate they are ready to give in extra hours they are ready to take in night shifts and i'm talking about women as well right when you go to big cities women are readily available for these these night shifts and you know they're ready to go the extra mile to match with their male colleagues but i feel that it's something that the government and employers should focus on improving the quality of jobs is very important don't just give a huge paycheck social security is a right that everyone should have when they are employed in this country and uh, it's important to just go beyond the paycheck you know give um, go the extra mile you know a lot of employers when they list down job applications on linkedin for example you know they say we are the family and all that you know everything about and work culture and all that you know they list down i think that work culture should take into account what the employee wants versus what the employer think it's okay and i think in general the employee wants flexibility they want some benefits like paternity leave for example right if your child is born you should get extended holiday just to take care of them without your job being affected many companies these days including the one that i have been working in they introduce a skill upgrading policy wherein they give you free access to a platform wherein you can upgrade your skill and i think that's very very important and beneficial to people because even if you are employed right if you have to give an on 5 to 10k for a certificate it seems like a big amount and that's you know that's probably a reason why a uh, skill friction might exist you know so i think it's important that employers can probably go the extra mile if they have the budget for such activities and allow your employees to upgrade their skills and of course inculcating better hr practices again very very important you know don't just i think i'm speaking both as an employee and and someone who's working in this project and don't just get someone on board just for the sake of it you know when you uh, i think like i said before that improving the quality of the job is very important because um, i feel like 
you know, that's why the great attrition rate is happening because the quality of jobs is not great. And if there's going to be a point where, you know, people might move out of the country or they might, in case of women, for example, I think they might just be okay with, probably this is just an assumption, but I've seen, you know, like women moving out of the country, getting married and all that. And data exists on that, that, you know, women are readily doing that, giving up their jobs out of family pressure and all. So don't let that be an option for them, right? Make it flexible for them to be employed at the company. If they want work from home, give them work from home. You can create a hybrid environment, but always keep your employee when you're making key decisions, which affects them. That's what my take is. I'll pass it over to you to add to this. I think like just adding a little bit onto what you said, as you said, we need data as to where people are going. And I think one huge step in that has been understanding that people are moving towards, you know, entrepreneurial ventures. But now we have to understand that, you know, it's, it's only people with a certain kind of privilege that is and capital that are able to, you know, be self-employed and actually sustain themselves over time. When you do have people with lesser privilege and capital becoming entrepreneurs, there is a higher chance that it could lead to failure. The incidence could be much higher, which is why it becomes important for there to be policies that provide access to credit so that personal capital is not hampered, especially when years have gone into saving that kind of capital. And I think, secondly, as you mentioned, what this whole conversation has reminded me of something called the beverage curve. It's, you know, generally a mismatch in the labor market is, you know, this upending of this usual relationship between unemployment and job openings. Now, normally when unemployment is rising, the job openings are going to fall because employers know they can choose from a very large pool of workers and uh, falling unemployment on the other hand is generally associated with a very large number of openings. And this is what is called the beverage curve after the economist William Beveridge, who studied the difficulties of matching workers to jobs. Yet what we're seeing after the pandemic is quite unique because unemployment is also very high. Job openings are also elevated at the same time. And it's not something that is happening just right now, which is happening for the last one week. This has been going on for months. It's not a phenomenon that is limited to India. It's been it's being seen in the US as well, where last year they had a record number of 10.1 million jobs and 8.1 million unemployed people, yet those postings weren't getting covered. So I think while we've tried to do a causal analysis of what really could be the reason, I also feel like there is a greater need to sit down to understand what are the structural features of our economy that are driving people away from the workforce where people don't want the job security that comes with the organized sector and are willing to forego that for something, you know, far more unstable, so to speak. But I also agree with you that this could mean the transformation of our economy into lower reliance on what we've considered traditional jobs and maybe an increased reliance on more non-conventional jobs. And if that is the case, then we are going to see a very large transformation of the economy. The question then just becomes who is able to reap the benefits of such a transformation. Because if it is people like you and I, we are reaping the benefits irrespective. I think the people who need to reap the benefits most out of such a transformation are those who continue to be tied up in the farm sector because of an acute lack of options in the non-farm sector. And it was essentially why during the pandemic, we saw a contraction in even manufacturing jobs for the first time in years in decades, in fact, and we saw a rise in farming jobs. And that is something we must really think about and what is really driving people into jobs with far lower incomes, far lower security and far more uncertainty. And why would people prefer that over, you know, what has often been touted as, you know, what one should aim for, what is a good life, is having a good job, why? Is that dream changing now? And I think a causal analysis for that becomes important. And more than that, we've also noticed that the uptake in Narega jobs has been going, uh, the uptake in Narega jobs has been higher than it was previously, especially with the influx of migrants back to rural areas. But 
the funding to Narega has been reduced significantly. So we need to understand that if people are availing such policies, maybe while we're still figuring out why they're discouraged from the labor force, we shouldn't, you know, maybe get rid of any sort of jobs that they could have outside of the farming sector. But that's just what I think. Yeah. Okay. I think we've discussed whatever we wanted to discuss on this topic. And with this, I think I'd like to close this podcast. Just to summarize, I think it's important for policymakers and the government to curate data on where these people are exactly going to see whether this picture is completely negative, completely positive, or a mixture of both. And it's probably the third, but the data would, that would, on that would be nice. Employers need to step up and do, uh, they should come up with policies that make workers stick around. And in general, I think the discourse, like we said before, should not just be on increasing the number of jobs, but also on improving the quality of jobs and this should happen simultaneously. Thanks to everyone who listened to this podcast. Keep listening to All Things Policy and next week we'll be back with another podcast on 20 million jobs. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Arushri. Thank you so much for having me. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Hello, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcasts Network. On Think Fast, Varun and Sochita talk about how the podcast industry hit the 1 billion mark. On Big Talk About Tiny Humans, Devi Shobha and Meghna address video game addiction in children. On The Longest Constitution, Priya explores the limits of free speech. On All Things Policy, the Takshashila folk discuss various aspects of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework or IPEF. And on Football Twaddle, Saru, Baru and Yash analyze Real Madrid's UCL win. We've got some exciting news for you. IVM Podcasts has just launched its merch. And our first line is out now. Head to the IVM Podcasts website and click on the shop tab to check out our first collection of t-shirts. Do follow us on social media via IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platform you're listening on. And you can also check us out on YouTube. We're also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it out. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week. SBI Life Insurance. Jupiter, a digital banking app. Cap Gemini, get the future you want. Intel V Pro, built for business. And Intel, future banao wonderful with Intel-powered laptops.